I would say economic uh, efficiencies. So uh, I think this is especially true for for public institutions. So public institutions take public money to provide a valuable service to their to their citizens, which is to provide an education opportunity and and help educate people in Finland or whatever country they might be in. Um, there's a responsibility that goes with that, and part of that responsibility is to be judicious and efficient with the public funds that you're given. The public is putting that trust and responsibility in you, the public education institution. And I don't care if it's elementary or K-12 or higher ed or secondary school or tertiary, different countries call it different things. Um, but with that public money comes the trust and the responsibility of ensuring that those public institutions and policymakers are using and fully leveraging the tools of the day to make sure that as many people as possible have access, that the costs are as low as possible, and that the quality is as high as possible. So that's referred to as the, the iron triangle, right? Cost, quality, and access. And the traditional way of thinking about that is when one of those increases, by definition, the other two have to decrease. So uh, the traditional way of thinking about money is if, if I'm going to improve quality, then it's either going to cost more or I can serve fewer people, right? And with OER, we, we reject that iron triangle. We say, no. We, <laughs> in fact, we have a lot of money in public education, as I was saying in the last session. Um, what we do is we are very wasteful and inefficient with the way that we use that public money to build courses. We don't share what we build with public money very well. The, the policy makers do not require us to share. They should if we're using public money. Uh, and we don't leverage the goodwill of others. So uh, I would argue that faculty in the United States who are not leveraging the good OER that's coming out of Finland or Rwanda or South Africa are doing their students a disservice for two reasons. One, if I'm, char if I'm assigning an expensive $200 textbook and Finland has produced one of equal quality for free, then I'm, uh, my students are wasting money and that's my fault. Second, um, I I'm not the smartest professor in the world. There are some really bright people in Finland who I could benefit from and my students could benefit from and from everywhere else around the world. And the fact is, is that there are, uh, the last time I looked at the Open Education Consortium website, there's you know thousands or tens of thousands of courses that faculty all around the world have said, here, here's my course, my best thinking under a Creative Commons license. Uh, take some, it's free. Uh, so if we don't leverage that, if we don't move to a culture of, I always, I, I used to say, uh, we have to move away from our not invented here attitude about content, and we need to move to proudly borrowed from there. And proudly borrowed from there is the best professors in the world, the best teachers in the world, take content from everywhere, and then they synthesize it into something that's gonna make sense for their students in their country, in their learning environment. And if we're not doing that, we're doing a disservice to the public's trust, and we're, we're wasting the public money, and we're doing, most important, a disservice to our students. As OER goes mainstream, so as we start to uh, take uh, over textbook markets, as we start to get significant adoptions of open courseware, as we start to uh, change the rules on money, so we call those open policies, as governments start to require that publicly funded resources are openly licensed, um, first, how do we do that in, a, uh, in an organized way as a community with a set of best practices that there's agreement on to the extent that you can get agreement in a large community? Uh, and how do we do it in a way that is going to uh, maximize the impact of OER and open policies and, and, uh, and, uh, and not just maximize the impact but the speed at which we get there? So for example, um, I think it's, it's a fair assumption to say that uh, open textbooks will be the reality for the 100 highest enrolled courses on the planet. We all teach roughly the same thing in our general education curriculum. There will be five, 10 versions of every one of those textbooks. The question is, uh, how fast will we get there? Will that take 10 years or will that take 10 months? 
and depending on uh, how we structure ourselves, uh, how we set goals, how we set strategy, um, that will determine how successful and how fast we can how, how fast we can move on textbooks, on uh, new forms of open practices and open pedagogies, on new open business models as we're working with companies and we can get support from uh, companies both monetarily and philosophically. Um, and then I think the, the second big point we discussed in the session was what kind of fight will come from existing entrenched business models who are, it's not that they don't like open or don't agree with open, it's that it threatens their existing financial models. And at, at what point do we become impactful enough or large enough and we threaten their existing business models and flows of revenue enough that they will rear up and fight with everything they have. Uh, they do have, uh, when I say they, uh, let me give a few examples. Uh, this could be commercial textbook publishers would be a good example. Um, but they have much more money than we have, they have more lawyers than we have, and they, uh, they have better political connections than we have. So at some point they'll pull that trigger. Uh, they really haven't yet, which surprises many of us. Uh, they, they will. So uh, part of our strategy of uh, scaling and getting the impact is we have to include preparing for and creating a response to those attacks when and if they come. So as you point out, Creative Commons has six different open copyright licenses. So those are those a choice that people can make. Uh, we also have two public domain tools. One of them is called CC0 which lets you dedicate your work to the public domain today. Uh, so in the United States, for example, for your work to go in the public domain, first you have to die, and then 70 years have to pass. And as Larry was talking about in this morning's keynote, uh, copyright continues to get extended and extended, and there's international conversations right now about extending it for another 20 years. And so, uh, so for educators who choose to share now and would like to use others' works now, uh, existing copyright makes that difficult. So Creative Commons is the way that you can keep your copyright and, and share it. Now the public domain tools let you actually dedicate your work to the public domain today. Our second public domain tool is uh, the public domain mark. That's to mark works that are already in the public domain so people know they're in the public domain. So those are those two tools. The, the, the six licenses you refer to, uh, you're right, that's a lot of choice. Um, that is by design, has been for 10 years. There's different uh, reasons for different licenses. But to your point, how do we simplify it for open education? Uh, the community, uh, of course anybody can choose to share or not share, and anybody can use any license that they, they want to use. That being said, the open education community has sought to uh, be clear about which licenses work well for education and which do not. And so the, the preferred license, if you will, uh, for educational use is the Creative Commons Attribution License. So, uh, for example, I, I mentioned open policy. When we're trying to convince governments and others that have money and are funding educational resources, we always advocate for the CC BY license, being the license of choice for uh, governments to require when they give money. And so that's a good rule of thumb. There are, uh, obviously, people who feel very strongly about the share-alike license. They feel that if you take my educational work and you modify it, uh, you too should be forced to share your work forward with the rest of the world. That's what Wikipedia does. So, you know, people have different preferences. My preference, and of course I can't speak for the community, but uh, I always use CC BY licenses on my works. And the reason for that is I want to maximize the flexibility and the freedoms that I give to other educators. Because I don't know what you might want to do with my work. And the more restrictions I put on my Creative Commons license, the less freedom I give you. And that's not my intention. My intention is to share as completely and fully as I can. The best way to do that is to use the CC BY license. So, so where do you start? I start with where the advocates are. And I don't care where they are. Uh, sometimes the, the leaders are from the library. 
And I say, okay, let's start with the library. And what can the library do? Well, the library knows how to uh, find resources, how to store, how to have repositories and store and share resources. Librarians are all about sharing. They're about helping faculty find resources for the learning environment. They help students find resources. It's a great place to start. Uh, if the if it's you know the math department or the biology department, and they say you know we're sick and tired of assigning expensive textbooks for our 100 level or 200 level biology courses, we want to go open textbooks for the entire sequence of general education biology. I'd say great, let's start there. Sometimes it's the uh, sometimes it's the students. Uh, there are really there are two groups here: the Right to Research Coalition. Well, it was mentioned this morning. There was OpenCon over the weekend, right? These were student leaders from 40 countries around the world, who are graduate students and undergraduates. But these this is the next generation of professors and, and faculty, and uh, in some cases they're the ones saying, "Look, I'm tired of the high cost of textbooks," or "I'm." Uh, starting to write research uh, articles now, and I will be through my career, and I have to have an open access model that I can publish into because I want to be read, and I want other people to benefit from the knowledge, right? So those are all great places to start. Uh, the first thing I do is I put my radar up, and I listen, and I try to figure out who might be a leader on the campus, and then I would throw support behind them and develop it in that space first, and then have some success, collect data. So if it's, uh, you know, a lot of times it's uh, one or two faculty who are moving their course to OER and you want to collect data on how much money did it save students in textbook costs? Uh, what happened to the course outcomes? Did students do better in the course? Uh, did fewer students drop out of the course? Did it decrease time to, uh, time to degree completion? All these things tend to happen in OER. Uh, another thing we're learning from David Wiley's research is when uh, an institution, particularly community colleges, move a course to OER, the, uh, the college actually makes more tuition money on the course because fewer students drop out during the ad drop period. And that's very interesting. We didn't know that before. That caught the attention of the provost and the president because they're worried about the bottom line. They're now OER advocates. So. The answer is you start where there's the lowest hanging fruit. So when I, whenever I go to a, uh, a university or an elementary school, I, uh, I ask to speak to everyone in a big keynote session to uh, make sure everybody understands the basics of open education and the opportunity. But then I ask to meet with all the different constituent groups, first individually, and then collectively. So I ask to meet with the student leadership. I ask to meet with the teachers or the professors. Uh, and then the leadership of the professors. So I ask to meet with the faculty senate. Uh, I ask to meet with the administration, the deans, the provosts, the president, uh, the chancellors. Um, I ask to meet with the librarians, the bookstore, and the instructional design team, the online learning or e-learning team. Anybody that touches or cares about or funds or provides policies around the learning environment needs to be part of this conversation. Because if you don't include them, uh, oftentimes if they don't understand, they could become barriers to the process. And so uh, I always say it's, you know, it's a bottom up and it's a top down and it's from every side. It's a, it has to be a university wide or a school district wide or a, you know, in some cases a country wide conversation. If you try just to do it from the students uh, and the faculty don't understand why open is important, that's problematic. It is challenging, and you don't have to include everybody initially. Uh, so so I, I'm all about um, uh, finding the easiest path and picking the low-hanging fruit.